In this video, I'll give you three reasons that you should get an airbrush, and two reasons you shouldn't. I'm getting my hair cut tomorrow as I film this, so one more time with the feds for a while. There's a lot of tools used in the hobby portion of miniatures wargaming. You know, the, the building and the painting and all that stuff. And sometimes I feel like there's none as maligned as the airbrush. Some folks, and I'm hoping that, you know, it's fewer and fewer every day, but some folks like, you know, like to call airbrushing cheating. And I've always disagreed in that. And I'm pretty sure that I made a video about it even like a long time ago about, you know, how airbrushing is not cheating. I think. Pachow, hopefully. Uh, and I use my airbrush all of the time. Uh, and honestly, I should probably use it a little bit more on the projects that I do. But for those of you wondering if airbrushing is right for you in your miniatures hobby, I wanted to give you like three reasons that you should be airbrushing. However, I also have two situations in which you shouldn't be using an airbrush. Let's begin. Reason you should, number one, priming your miniatures. I say it all the time, but it's worth repeating for the folks in the back. Being able to prime your miniatures in any kind of weather, uh, pretty much no matter what kind of weather that might be, it's too cold, it's too hot, it's too humid, it's too dry, it's rainy, it's windy, it's, I don't know, lightning, hailing, whatever. It's the key to keeping your hobby progress constantly moving forward. I remember uh, years ago in the past, back in the day before I had an airbrush, I remember rushing outside during the warmest part of like the last nice day of the fall. Like you'd be looking at the you know, like the weather, out, you know, whatever, forecasting going, well, Saturday, like around three o'clock, it's going to be a 62 degrees. I'm going to go outside and it's, and I'm going to, you know, and you have a bunch of stuff built and you do all that stuff and you get out there and you rattle can all the things. And then you have stuff that you can paint, you know, over the long winter and, and all that kind of stuff. And you get through December and January and then, you know, February, and then you run out of things to paint because you've painted all the things that you primed. And then you have no new models to work on until spring. Even if you live in a part of the world where like the weather is generally okay for priming year round, then th there are still going to be days, even in those regions, that aren't ideal for priming, right? Like too humid or raining or uh, bees or who knows, whatever. Uh, also, if you just really want to prime like one or two minis, like you're not doing a whole army, you're doing maybe some... Dungeons and Dragons characters and stuff like that. You don't have to do a ton of stuff. Using a rattle can seems, frankly, wasteful for just a few models. There will be a lot of overspray, and it's harder to kind of get the, the primer into all of the nooks and crannies that you have on miniatures sometimes when you're doing rattle can. I generally find I have to pretty much prime the mini from, you know, while it's standing up, then I have to wait a while for it to kind of get a little dry, knock it onto its back, spray it from kind of like this direction, to get up underneath the chin and underneath the arms and all that kind of stuff, underneath the gun, potentially. And then I have to wait for a while and then knock it over onto its back and then spray it kind of, you know, up the backside to get the other parts. And it takes a lot of work. This is why I originally got my airbrush 10 years ago, and it has always been the right decision for me. Using an airbrush to prime your miniatures gives you more freedom, it saves you time, and it saves you paint. And now, reason you shouldn't, number one, priming terrain. Yes, I did just say that priming with your airbrush is the best thing since like sliced bread or whatever. But again, that's for your miniatures, the little folks that you build and put together. You treat your miniatures very differently than you treat your terrain. Miniatures are handled, in general, pretty gingerly, right? And they're stored in little foam trays or like with the magnetic bases, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So the minis... Like, painted surface doesn't touch anything. It just is, like, attached to that piece of metal or whatever. Terrain, on the other hand, well, it's frequently stacked on shelves or put in boxes or generally banged around. I always prime my terrain with rattle cans. Most of the big brands, specifically Krylon and Rust-Oleum, but there are others, they will generally mention uh, that their primers are formulated to stick to plastic. I think Krylon actually calls it fusion technology, which sounds very sci-fi. But 
they do that so you know that they're, they're they're getting the point across you can use this on plastic patio furniture or your kayak or stuff like that you know whatever but it also means that they are ideal for spraying onto plastic terrain kits but also better you know frankly for scratch built terrain as well whether it's plastic or or made out of whatever plus it takes far less time to prime terrain with a rattle can versus an airbrush you just have a larger area that thing that we had the problem with before about wasting a bunch of extra paint because there's so much paint coming out when you're only painting a few models, when you're painting terrain, that's less of a problem. Terrain can be huge, and so your airbrush can honestly take forever to cover it all. This is the same for MDF terrain as well. It's actually better to use an enamel rattle can primer to really help seal the MDF surface rather than using your airbrush. If you just shoot your normal primer that you use in your airbrush, you know, onto the MDF surfaces, it will take a ton of coats. And that is because the MDF will actually absorb the paint, right? And it will go in there, you'll spray it on there, it'll look good for a bit, and then all of a sudden it'll look like you barely sprayed anything, and then you'll do it again and again and again. It's really super important to seal it. And some people will use PVA glue, but that'll leave kind of a surface that can be kind of bumpy. Some people will use watered down PVA glue, and then the actual water in there, in my mind, will absorb and then sort of swell the MDF. I've been told by people who manufacture MDF that enamel primer actually works pretty much best, especially with a matte coat, right? So leave your terrain primer to the rattle cans and then do all of the other cool base coating and weathering and stencils and all that stuff on the terrain with your airbrush afterwards. Reason you should, number two, speed painting. I almost never just prime my miniatures a single color with my airbrush and then start working on the model with a traditional brush. I, I, I pretty much, I never do that. Like, I don't ever go, oh, I'm going to prime this guy all black with my airbrush and now I'm going to start painting him blue with a bunch of bristles and stuff like that. No, I, it's always, you know, first primer and then some sort of base color. And I at least do a simple Zenithal prime spraying like a lighter color, like white or whatever, over the darker initial primer in pretty much most situations these days. Once I have that kind of like black and white version of the model where the light is coming from above because I've sprayed the white down over the top of the black or whatever kind of dark color I might start with or whatever. Once I have that version of the model like ready to go and done, let it sit overnight. I generally let my airbrush primer, uh, you know, cure overnight. Then it's time to colorize the model with contrast paints, speed paints, any other transparent colors, including like washes and shades and glazes and stuff like that. I made a video about the ease of this method of speed painting, pachow. And while it certainly can be done over a Zenithal, you know, like created with either a dry brush, like cool makeup brushes and stuff like that, or even a rattle can, a white to black Zenithal usually looks best when done with an airbrush, which then makes your models look better faster after you start coloring them in you know, with the aforementioned transparent colors. The, the blends are smoother, specifically, you know, in, in the, the smoother, rounder, flatter kind of areas like panels on Space Marines and such. But your airbrush Zenithal doesn't have to be white to black, right? Like if your model will have a pretty dominant color, like maybe it's the color of the armor or the color of the giant, you know, cloak that the person is wearing, or it's a skin tone because they're mostly like don't have a lot of clothes on because they're a barbarian or whatever. If, if that's the case, then you can start with a darker primer that will work well with that dominant color, right? You prime first with whatever that might be. Maybe it's black, maybe it's a dark brown, maybe it's purple, something like that, depending on what it is. And then you use that brighter dominant color sprayed from above with your airbrush. This will not only give you that nice kind of zenithal highlight, but it, it will also have completed like large parts of the model, Space Marine armor, for example, right? Before you can even pick up a traditional brush. Then you can just start in painting the details because you don't have to paint all those other flat areas. Reason you shouldn't, number two, uh, painting details on your miniatures and terrain. Now, it is true that you can paint details on your miniatures with your airbrush. Well, I mean, some people can. I, I honestly can't, generally. Um, not without, like, either a really fine needle airbrush, something like that, or plenty of like preliminary masking using um, maybe tape, which I'm always a little nervous about putting onto a painted model, or silly putty, which is better. But you know, you have to do a lot of work ahead of time to mask out an area so you don't get overspray, right? Uh, and most importantly, it also takes a lot more practice and skill than I currently have. 
So it can be done, but you shouldn't worry about doing details with your airbrush as you start. And honestly, you may never want to get to that point. I generally save detail painting for the phase after I'm done with all of my airbrushing, right? So with the airbrush, you're priming, and then you're doing the zenithal. Then I start picking out the details with my traditional brushes, right? I usually give it again, like overnight to let it cure. Um, trying to pick out separate details with your airbrush, it, it can be done, as I mentioned, but it's frequently slower, especially if you haven't done it much like me. Um, and it is generally only done in very specific circumstances, if at all. Like, I've done it before on, like, lightning claws. I've painted the majority of the rest of the model, but on the lightning claws, I want to have that kind of white to blue fade. And then I have to cover the entire model in silly putty, except for the claws sticking out, and then, you know, do it from there, that kind of stuff. And, but the benefit is, is that, honestly, once you get done with all the detail, you can go back to the airbrush and do a bunch of transparent shading. Uh, you know, and, and, and kind of make the model kind of tie together real nice and stuff like that using, you know, speed paints, contrast, things like that. It works out really nice, though. Lastly, reason you should, number three, it's not as expensive as you might think. I mean, sure, it certainly can be. There are some very expensive airbrushes and compressors out there, and that's kind of the same with everything. There can be very expensive brushes, very, very expensive paints, obviously very expensive models. But as far as airbrush is concerned, you can currently get a master brand, that's the name of the brand, uh, airbrush and silent compressor kit for about a hundred bucks on Amazon. The airbrush is a three point or a point three needle, right? Uh, it's gravity feed, which is important for miniatures and stuff like that. It's two stage. So the trigger does the back thing and all that stuff. And the compressor, um, it has a pressure gauge and a setting dial and all that stuff, and even a moisture trap. It's pretty nice, actually. Is it incredibly robust? Will it last for decades? Probably not. I'll be very honest with you. But I think it's better, honestly, to start with a cheaper airbrush like I did. Like My first airbrush compressor wasn't even an airbrush compressor. It was actually a bright red pancake compressor from the hardware store, and it was loud. So loud. Uh, but it's better to start that way and then find out if you actually like the process and the results of airbrushing rather than to spend like honestly five to six hundred dollars up front for a top of the line airbrush and compressor set that you may not use very much after a year or two. So if you're one of those hobbyists that's on the fence, like wondering whether an airbrush is a good idea for your hobby progress or not, hopefully this list of shoulds and shouldn'ts will help you make your decision a little easier. If, if you can fit it into your hobby space, I personally think it'll really up how your models look and how quickly you can get them done. If you liked this video, it'd really help the channel if you click that little like button down below and subscribe if you want to see more from the channel. New videos every single Friday. Thanks for watching.